Hey guys, welcome back to the show, and on this episode, I'm going to be talking about a movie that I think could be the worst movie of 2021. That's right, no clickbait, I'm serious. I know we're only halfway through the year, but I'm calling my shot right now. I really don't think it can get any worse than this. It's Vanquish, starring Morgan Freeman and Ruby Roo. Now, you might look at this poster and think, okay, this is probably gonna be your typical action movie. You know, maybe not a massive budget, but you know, somewhere in between, like, you know, par for the course. Well, that's where you'd be wrong. Really, really, really wrong. Also, really quick, I just wanted to mention that there are brand new designs now available in the merch store. Link is in the description. And I know this is gonna sound harsh, but this is like amateur filmmaking at best, I'm sorry. It actually kind of reminds me of Ballistic X versus Sever in many ways. You know, the story is just, it's horribly developed. The characters are completely one dimensional. The list just goes on and on. It's really a style over substance situation and the style isn't that great to begin with. You can actually tell how brutal this thing is gonna be from the opening credits, believe it or not. I don't know if it's the random footage or the fact that the movie is beating us over the head with exposition from the get-go. It just keeps showing these newspaper headlines and it's like, okay, we get it. He was a hero cop. Of course, like I said, this is all intercut with this random footage, which makes this whole thing look super amateur. A shot of the city with some kind of filter over it for some reason. Oh, look, a gun. Oh, there's another gun flying in. A snake and a gun. I'm sure that will be part of the movie somehow. Just like all of these birds. There's a animal eyeball with a lighthouse behind it. And of course, a crucifix with, I don't know, what is this, fire? You know what, who cares? It's all irrelevant shit, I'm telling you right now. And this opening credit sequence goes on for a really long time. It's six minutes long. I'm willing to bet that the Union wanted the names of the crew at the beginning of the movie because they knew no one would be sticking around long enough to see them at the end. So here's the first shot of a church, and even that looks terrible somehow. And now we have some B-roll of the inside of the church as Morgan Freeman is in the confession booth. And during this whole conversation between Morgan Freeman's character, Damon, and the priest, the movie keeps cutting to B-roll of the interior of the church. This is pointless and quite frankly takes away from the discussion. I don't care what the inside of the church looks like. Is this crucifix of any importance? No. The focus should be on the characters and what they're talking about. And if what they're talking about is of so little importance that you have to keep the audience's attention by showing them the stained glass windows, then this discussion shouldn't even be in the movie in the first place. This is literally the first scene in the movie. You're trying to build character and story. And spoiler alert, the interior of the church has nothing to do with either. And now we have some rats. This scene takes place in, I don't know, some place with rats where these three guys are beating up some other guy who is clearly a cop. I guess now we're seeing this through the eyes of the rat who is watching this whole thing. So I guess these are all crooked cops and this cop was wearing a wire. Oh my God, do you get it now? The rat, because this guy is a rat. But why do we have to see this through the point of view of the rat? I don't know. I guess they thought it looked cool. Remember, this movie is more about style than anything else. Anyways, we're now at Damon's house, and just in case you were curious about the layout, here's the 25 cent virtual tour. And of course, just in case you forgot, he used to be a cop. See? Here's all of his awards. We gotta really we gotta drill that into your brain. And I guess he's working with these crooked cops, making money off of illegal activities. But then in comes his caretaker with her daughter and starts making him dinner. And I'm just wondering, is this all she does? Because we don't see her do anything else. She obviously doesn't live with him and she shows up late and just starts cooking dinner, which honestly sounds like a pretty sweet gig. I would do that job. But then again, I really don't think I'd be any good at it. I'm no chef. I would come in there like, all right, we're having pizza again today, but tomorrow we're gonna be finishing our trip around Italy with some pasta, a little dish I like to call macaroni and cheese. And then on Sunday, I'll be making my specialty, peanut butter and jam sandwiches. Cut diagonally, of course. Nothing less than the best. Wow, look at how real these clouds look. 
Somebody paid for the expensive Final Cut Pro plugins. Anyways, it turns out that Victoria's daughter is sick with something, but no one knows what it is. I guess it's just a big mystery. Just like the mystery of why Morgan Freeman agreed to do this movie. Anyways, Damon is like, let me pay for it, even though nobody knows what it is, because you and your daughter are all I have left in this world. Of course, Victoria is like, oh my god, Damon, that's insanely generous. And he's like, there's just one thing I need in return. See, I know you used to run drugs for the Russians, so I know that you know how to use guns and drive vehicles. So you're gonna have to make five different stops and pick up my money from these stops, and you might have to kill some people. And she's like, wait, what? What the hell is going on here? And he's like, seriously, how do you think I got all this money? by being a good guy. Anyways, take a few minutes and think about it. So after a few minutes, she's like, yeah, no, I'm not doing this for you. I have a daughter now. Speaking of which, where the hell is my daughter? And Damon is just like, oh yeah, I locked her up somewhere. Don't worry though, you'll get her back as long as you do everything I say. So let this be a lesson to all you parents out there. Never take your kids anywhere. And here's what I don't get. Not to sound insensitive or anything, but he's the one in a wheelchair. <laughs> like, you have the upper hand. Just go over there, grab his phone, push him out of that wheelchair, and make him tell you where she is. Start beating him up. Torture him if you have to. Go around the house, start kicking in doors. Try to find her. Start smashing his shit. Like, I mean, think about it. What is he gonna do? Crawl over to the neighbors and ask for help? Just drag him back. So anyways, she's like, fine, I'll do it. And he takes her over to his gun and grenade collection, which I guess he just keeps in a glass case beside the TV. And she's off on her motorbike. Damon has Victoria hooked up with cameras so that he can watch everything that happens on a TV that pops up out of a secret compartment, which is kind of weird. I mean, why would you have to hide this TV? This thing is hidden better than the weapons. Why don't you just have this stuff hooked up to your main TV in a different input and then keep the, you know, pistols, shotguns, and explosives in the super secret compartment. But then again, that would just make sense. Anyways, as she drives to the first stop, she has flashbacks of the dialogue we literally just heard. I guess it's supposed to be dramatic, but just comes off cheesy as all hell. What kind of pickups? Money. Lots of it. Mom? Help me! Then she stops in the middle of the road and think some more about the stuff that literally just happened, and then keeps going. Damon is able to communicate with her the whole time she's doing these pickups. I don't know how he's doing this though, because at no point in this movie does it look like she's wearing any kind of earpiece inside of her ear. The first pickup is inside of this strip club, which is a real popular place. Two people, wow. No wonder this guy keeps his safe wide open. What's the point of closing it when there must be so much cash just flowing in all the time? So she kills everyone in there except this one girl and takes all the money. Get me out of here, please. Victoria's plan to get her out of there is just to act casual and she tells her to pretend that she's super funny, which in my opinion would just seem incredibly suspicious. And the two guys outside are like, hey, wait a minute, something feels wrong here. Maybe it has something to do with all those gunshots we heard. Because, you know, they definitely heard those gunshots. Normally, there would be music and people and a lot of noise to muffle the sound of gunfire. But in this situation, on it, you can't tell me that those gunshots wouldn't ring out throughout that place like the Sistine Chapel. So this guy's pissed off because she killed his cousin. And Damon is like, hey, look on the bright side. The club belongs to you now. And just check out this acting. The deal of us. No harm comes to her as long as you keep her in her cage. She got out. Well then, it's open season. I'm actually amazed that my TV screen didn't just shatter into a million pieces from all the intensity in that scene. So now she's back on the road, and once again, having flashbacks of what literally just happened. Get me out of here. Please. Anyways, she drops off money to Damon, and then it's off to the next pickup. 
And in case you haven't already guessed, this is going to be the whole movie. Going to a pickup, fighting bad guys, getting the money, coming back again and again and again. This is basically the movie version of a GTA fetch mission with all the fun taken out of it. So now she's going to the next pickup at this warehouse where these guys are running some kind of, I don't know, carnival ride chop shop. And you can tell these are some real bad dudes. I mean, look at them. Counting money, watching curling. Yeah, curling is a very hardcore sport. Have you ever watched it before? It can get very intense. There is a lot of yelling. Anyways, this scene goes on for a really long time. Everyone's just kind of standing there waiting. The problem is that this isn't really building any intensity, not even when she pulls out the gun. It's just boring, and the terrible editing doesn't exactly help either. So she leaves with the money, but then there's the Russian guys. But that's no problem because she just casually tosses them a grenade. Damon then tells her to get out of there as if she was going to hang around the explosion. And then there's this chase, but again, there's no real suspense here. And you know that nothing crazy is going to happen because it's not like they're gonna risk damaging any of these vehicles. That Rolls Royce probably costs more than the production budget. So they drive into this shipping yard and here comes the discount John Woo shot. Also, some of the camera angles on this bike seem entirely pointless. What's the point of Damon watching her back? Anyways, the Russians make a call and say, get the truck and block the exit. I love how there's absolutely no one else to be seen working in this place, but conveniently there's one truck driver at the exit. And here comes the big stunt where she slides under the truck. Something that you've seen a million times before in movies, but it's a big moment here, I mean, did she survive the slide? Well, of course she did. And now because of that, the chase is over? What? She even starts driving slower? She hasn't gotten away. She's just a bit further in the shipping yard. Just tell the guy in the truck, hey, reverse the truck, and then just keep chasing her. It's not like she's weaving in and out of downtown traffic. It's a wide open space. Anyways, she goes back to Damon and she's like, this sucks, tell me where my daughter is. And he's like, can't you do math, Victoria? It's three more stops. Three more stops. Three more stops. You got three more stops. Three more stops. If there is a single scratch on her body, I swear. Look, to God. Victoria, do you know what that means? Three more stops. Don't make him tell you again, seriously, because then it will just be even more comical. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the color wheel, the crooked cops are waiting for this guy who works for the feds to tell them all about the evidence they have against them and to work on a deal. So now Victoria goes to a graveyard and there's just fireworks going off. Why? No reason at all. It's just because, again, it's supposed to look cool. This is where she picks up money from the priest because, you know, the priest is crooked too. Hey, do you wanna just meet up in the parking lot at your church? No, no, it's gotta be in the graveyard. All right, that'll make me look super cool. I'll be in all these shadows and I'll be all, you know, priesty. Meanwhile, Damon is just sitting at home staring at nothing really while one of the crooked cops is able to, I guess, just walk into his house. They both shoot him, but there's no real concern that maybe he wasn't the only one. I mean, you know she's out there collecting your money from all these bad guys, killing people. You know that there's bad guys out there that want to kill you. Don't you want to at least check to make sure there's no one else in the house? Lock a door, maybe? I don't know. So she leaves, again, to go to her next stop. And while she's driving, she starts having flashbacks and thinking about her daughter again. Yes, she's trying to get her daughter back and she's worried. We get it. This, this has been established multiple times now. Anyways, she goes to this guy's place where he gives her a drink and she drinks it for some reason. I thought she was supposed to be some kind of a pro. Like, I mean, you go to the location, you get the money, and you get out. You don't hang around. You don't chit-chat. You don't take drinks. Like, these people aren't your friends. They're not happy to see you. You're taking their money away from them. Why would you trust them? Of course, there was something in the drink, so now she starts tripping balls. But it's okay, because there's cocaine on the table. No! 
And that helps her kill everyone and get out of there. Isn't this just so compelling? There's this whole negotiation between the crooked cops and the crooked FBI agent, which, again, you don't care about because... You don't care about any of these characters. Victoria comes back to the Neon Palace with her face still covered with cocaine. And take a guess at what happens next. She drops off the money, drives to the last stop, and that's right, starts having flashbacks of what we literally just saw. Anyways, this last stop is somehow the most boring and least intimidating of all of them. I don't know, she wakes up at the governor's house. Honestly, who cares? None of these characters are interesting. None of these scenes are engaging. She kills her and steals the governor's McLaren and heads back to Damon, who seriously has the exact same expression that I had the whole time I was watching this. He tells her to keep the money, she leaves with her kid. The crooked cops get there and he blows up the house. Well, it looks like she got away with everything and oh, check out this shot. So I guess in the end she got to escape and finally have a picnic with her daughter. I don't know, thank God it's over. Now, like I said at the beginning, for many reasons, this whole movie looks extremely low budget. And not just the writing and directing or the fact that the story and characters are razor thin. But here's one thing that will stand out that always makes a movie look extremely low budget. In this movie, there are characters, but in all of these scenes, there are no other people. There's no background, there's no extras, there's no people anywhere. No one in the streets, no one in the diner, no one in the strip club, no one working in the shipping yard. Now, you could say that this movie was made during the COVID-19 pandemic, which makes sense, that's fine, but it doesn't escape the fact that when you're trying to sell realism, you need people in some of these locations as background in order to achieve that. I mean, it's not like this movie takes place in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. And you can write in all the excuses that you want into the script. You know, oh, it takes place at night. Okay, fine, but guess what? There's still people out at places at night. So when you don't have any extras, not only does it take away from the realism of those locations, but it also looks extremely low budget because the less people that you have in a shot, the less people that you have to pay to be in that shot. Like I said, I don't think there's gonna be another movie that comes out this year that will be worse than this but I am more than happy to be proved wrong. And on that note, thanks for watching guys. And I'll see you all next time. My friend Paul said to me a few weeks ago, he's like, did Ruby Rose leave Batwoman to go and do this? <laughs> and I thought about it and I, I was thinking, yeah, that's like, if that's true, that's like she just left the dumpster to go hang out in the sewer. Why don't you just have all this stuff hooked up to your main TV? Will you need someone to come over and show you how to work it? All right, Gramps, um, see this button here, input? All right, so input one is TV. All right, we watch your programs. Press input again, go down to input two. That's all your surveillance stuff, all right? One and two, that's it. Just press this input button to go back and forth. If, if you're having trouble, call me.